All right, folks, it is officially six o'clock, which means it's officially time where you get to listen to me for a minute or two. Don't worry, I won't be up here long. <laughs> So my name is Hazel, and I am a librarian here at Curtis Memorial Library. And first, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all so very much for attending this evening's event. Um, my job here today is very small. It's to do a quick few reminders, and I've even written them down, so hopefully I don't forget any of them. First, I wanted to let you know that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we have our little camera that's in the window there. And so, and then we have some other fancy cameras tonight. So just be sure that if you stand up, we might ask you just to move so that the back of your head doesn't go viral, okay? Um, if you want that to happen, don't worry. We can connect you to our library of things and all of the tools we have at our library at another time. Um, so second, in the interest of time, um, we will be answering as many questions as we can um, with a microphone and one speaker. So if you have a question you want to ask, we encourage you to write it down on the piece of paper with a pen you have in front of you or on your chair or wherever you've moved it, into your hands now, probably. Uh, you're going to get more information on that process a little later on. Um, as always, we have a code of conduct that asks us to be respectful and be safe. And as always, we encourage you to take care of yourself. So if you need to use the restroom or if you need to use the water fountain, we have those facilities available for you right around the corner here towards the entrance. Um, the library will be closed at 8, so please be aware that um, as we end this event this evening, you might not be able to walk through the library on your way out. Um, finally, I want to ask all of those of you who are like me to check and see if you have one of these pesky devices. Um, this is my noise machine. It's a surprise uh, it's, um, flashlight, ooh, all sorts of things. But if you might turn yours on silent like mine, I think that would be more enjoyable for all of us. And so with that, I think my job is done. Check, 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 check. Thank you, thank you all for coming tonight. And I'm gonna turn this event over to Maggie from United Way. Yes, I left it on. Great, thank you. Thank you, Hazel. And thank you all for being here. So in just one moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Maurice Namwira. But for, before that, I would just like to talk about kind of the structure of the night. So I'll introduce Maurice. Maurice will do his presentation. And then after, we will allow time for written questions. Um, again, that is what the papers on your seat are for. When he's done presenting, we'll come around and collect those, and then they will be vetted and potentially asked in a random order if they're relevant to tonight. Um, so just bear with us with that. You also have exit surveys on your chair. Please take a few seconds at the end of this presentation to fill those out, give us feedback, um, and tell us what would be helpful for you in the future. Thank you. So tonight's speaker is Maurice Niamwira, Maurice emigrated to the United States in 2012 from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In the Congo, Maurice was the executive director of a human rights organization. Maurice is a pastor, project manager, trainer, educator, husband, father, and grandfather. Since his time in Maine, he has worked in several different industries and at different organizations, including Maine Medical Center, Catholic Charities, Residential and Community Support Services, MAS Community Health, Independence Association, and Midcoast Maine Community Action. Today, Maurice lives in the Midcoast area with his family, and he is the cultural services caseworker for the town of Brunswick. Please join me in welcoming Maurice Namwira. It's a privilege to have you tonight here. I want to share my story, but mostly have a time to share knowledge. <coughs> Nobody will know that coffee can keep someone awake until when they got to it 
and was awake all the day, all the night. And then they discovered that this can be useful for us. Your presence here show me how much you want to know how to help more people who are coming from different countries and choose to relocate in Maine. We are all human beings and when a human being is before a, any kind of threat, the first reflex is either to run or to stay and confront. You can confront it when you can, and if you can't, run away. It's for your safety. This is what happened to me when I was before a, a life-threatening, and I had to decide what way to take. I decided to move out and try to find another place where I can live and raise my family and be uh, useful for the community. As I said, I've been working in human rights for many years. And as a pastor, we always hear people with things, problems. And it was almost too much. On top of those threats, life was being threatened. So natural disasters happen everywhere in the world. It's not only in one side where we can see floods, hurricanes, wood fire, drought, all those happen and they are threatening the human being. In some countries, happen bad governance, corruption, poverty, injustice, hunger, war, rebellion. My country has been in rebellion for more than 20 years. Over 10 million have been killed. From direct and proxy war. People face some inequality, discrimination, gangs, activities, terrorism, you know, and some pandemic diseases that all push a person out of his regular place to live. And whenever you find that it's impossible to survive, you need to use your brain, think deeper, and find a way, another place to go, and see if you can be safe, and spend the time God, God gave you to be on this world. It was already said that I'm Maurice Namwira. I come from Congo. Most people don't know Congo. I remember in 2005 when I was here in New York at a meeting, we were launching a network of uh, global partnership for prevention of armed conflict. And I asked someone, do you know where is Congo? And he said, Congo? I don't know. You don't know Congo? This country in the heart of Africa? I don't know. Ask me Mississippi and misery. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you are right. I don't know Mississippi, misery, but I know Somali, I know Congo, Sudan, all those countries. And the only story that is known is that those countries are in rebellion, in war, people are killing their guy like animals. They are not. They are good people, but facing atrocities. In 2005, I was in a meeting, as I said, and after my trip to New York, I planned to be back home 
on the 29th of July, 2005. My plan was to meet with my boss before I resume all my trip and tell him what was the outcome of my voyage. You know what happened? I was traveling in my jet lag and prepared to be awake because when you are sleeping here, there they are awake there. And when you come from there to here, you have to sleep like someone who is under control. And they give me a call and said, you know what? They just shoot your boss and he's dead. That was not terrible to understand. I couldn't support it. I woke up and went. I met him lying in the blood. I couldn't believe that it was true, but it was really him. I couldn't have a time to talk to him, even one minute, because he was already gone. And after his death, they make a plot to make me a scapegoat, to justify what happened to my boss. And two months later, I was arrested and put in jail for nothing. You know how jail are? Someone who has been in jail already know how, what is happening there. It was horrible. But I didn't give up. I said, I want to prosecute those who are supposed to be the killers of my boss. And I introduced the case, and for seven years, I was following the case as a survival and resilient. But at the end, I realized that I became the target. Wherever I was going, picture taken, finger pointed, I had to be very, very careful. It took seven years before deciding to fly, to, to get out of my country. And in 2012, it was impossible to resist. I had to go. But I have a nostalgia of my home. I have a nostalgia of my people. I have a nostalgia of my fellow Christians, pastors, human rights. I can't have them speak to me because later after, other prominent activists were shot dead. If not shot dead, they were strangled. And I have a, a kind of uh, feeling of losing my home because I had to move from where I was born and grown up to find another country where exactly to go. During time, I've been traveling all over the world, attending seminaries and meetings. But um, I want to make a good choice now because it's very decisive to where I will be and where I will restart and emerge in a new life. I try to understand what is the meaning of home. And everybody here may give the same answer even more. I would understand home as a place to live with our families and our pets, where we can be in peace and enjoy with friends when they come visit us, where we can build memories to live as legacy when we pass away, a place where we can build our future and be ourselves in confidence. That's home. 
and we are always proud to be home. That's why we have, we have names. I am Congolese, I'm American, I'm I don't know what, I'm French, I'm Belgian. Because it gives you opportunities in life. It's a place where you can raise your family, educate your children, laugh with them, laugh with visitors, grandpa, grandchildren, when they come home, they are safe. Nothing can bother them. It is a shelter where you are protected from this winter. And I do remember the first time I came, <laughs> it was sunny up and chilly in my bed. <laughs> so it's a very contradiction. I jumped out because I saw the sun. But it was very impossible to spend two minutes. <laughs> and I said, in Africa, when you see the sun, you get out. But here, you can see the sun is staying home, <laughs> watching it just over. And I have to learn how to wear more than one shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Outside is cold, inside is burning. <laughs> oh. I'm no home anymore. But I'm in the process of returning home, right? I miss my beautiful Lake Kivu. Look at this. How beautiful it is. I used to be on, in the, on the lake and visit all those little islands. And we have fishes over, all type of fishes, big, small, anchovies. And they taste good because no pesticide, no uh, GMO, nothing. All is natural. But I miss my kifu. And I have to make and adjust to my new Kivu, which is now Maine. But taking this kind of decision, you have to pay a price. And the price to pay is to go through a, process, a tough process of asylum seeking and endure all the humiliation that come with it. You need to adapt and reunite your family with you when possible. In my case, I had to wait six years before being granted asylum. So all together with the reunification of all my family, it took six years. But that was not enough because the process is still long. After that, we need to go through what they call the permanent residency and have all the papers and qualify for a good job. <coughs> I couldn't speak English when I came. It was like a barbaric language. <laughs> Let someone who has a potato in the mouth, and then when you are speaking, you say, How about God? Heave, heave, too. <laughs> I had to endure the singleness life. A father of 10 children, but living alone for so long. No kiddos. Six years after my family came, after the process was done. To go through this process, you need to be humble and curious. Humility always pays. Curiosity 
will help you to learn what you don't know. Never pretend that you know. There is always someone who knows something you don't know. And that was me. I was always open to talk about my challenges. Whatever I went through, I spoke with people for any age because I knew that they know something I don't know. And I told you, how could I know to wear four, five shirts <laughs> to get out <laughs> if someone didn't teach me? And they said, why did you choose to go to Maine? <laughs> when it's cold. It's like your nose and your mouth. When it's cold there, it all come down here. And they said, we have Canada on top, and then come Minneapolis, and then Maine. <laughs> I choose Maine because in this winter time, no flies. <laughs> No mosquitoes. <laughs> Everything is quiet. And I'm safe. It's not only safe, but I'm also in danger because when it's icy, <laughs> can you spit and have your, <laughs> your spot like a, a bullet? That's pain. But going from home to home, I had to make a plan. And the plan was what? First, learn English. That will help me to communicate with others. Second, learn a new skills. Because what I've been doing back home, I may not be able to do it now, here. And those opportunities may not be there. So. I learn how I can start at the basic level and move forward. I was most of the time admitted to be member of the boards of different organizations just because I wanted to know how things function here comparing to where I come from. And that was a good experience. Being in this process, you need to be in a life adjustment. And by life adjustment, what I, need, I mean is to add more skills on what you have already. If I am a doctor in Congo, if I was a doctor in Congo and come here, I know my colleague doctors, they can't even touch a patient they have to go and do a new test and a new exam and learn again because they are supposed to not know how things work. On my side, I decided to learn something and how I can be involved in the community. I choose some domain that I know are mostly frequented by people. I started by taking my first training of PSS, which is personal support specialist, helping people with disability and whatever. Then after I took other trainings, like DSP to help people with mental disabilities or with mental challenging, how to assist when you are in a residential house, <coughs> to medicate them when nurses are not coming, they train us to do so. But because we are people in the community, we had to learn also how to be in the middle of the village, and especially in, men, in healthcare. I learned how to cook. Back home, men are not cookers, <laughs> except if they are working in a hotel or in a restaurant. But here, I was myself, man and woman, doing everything myself, 
and cooking what we call bugali. It's tough, huh? If someone has tasted bugali here, who has tasted the bugali? The one we cut like this. Fufu, food. Those who come from Africa know that. So, um, you know, when we are in a new country, we need to know the culture, we need to know how to communicate with people. And I said, I know some of spoken languages in my country, and now I have a little English. If I'm in the middle, I can help doctors, teachers, and us social workers to bring services to these people who are not speaking English yet. And then I went to learn how to communicate in English. I start being a medical interpreter, admin medical, social interpreter, and school interpreter with Catholic charities, and cross-cultural interpreting, let people understand the culture. Something is the same, but it is differently understood. I learned how to be ready to work when I get my work permit, which took like a year. <laughs> and, you know, everything run with money, right? So, if you don't know how to manage money, you can bankrupt quickly. I learned how to manage money and how to save to build wealth. But everybody has one word on the lips. <coughs> Do you have a good credit? And I said, I didn't take any credit of anybody. <laughs> no, you don't know how to answer and say, well, that's no credit. I didn't take any credit. Because credit in French means I go and borrow your money and I will pay you back. <coughs> so you ask me to, to build a credit? I'm not taking money for anybody. No, building credit here is like people trust you. Ah! Oh my goodness. <laughs> Language sometimes is complicated. And I say, is that the case? I want to know how to build good credit. They taught me to always pay your bills on time. <laughs> and if I pay my bills on time, what happened after that? <laughs> after that, you have a number starting by 321, 321, up to 680 something, 635, oh, 835. And that number we do what? If you have that number and a good number, when you go to the bank and you apply for a loan, you get a good rate. Aha! Good to know. <laughs> and every time when I get a bill, I run to pay it quickly. <laughs> because I'm building a credit. And Usually, I asked questions. I don't ask the why question here, and I didn't put my why question over there, because why questions are always embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I just choose the how question, because it brought me to learn something. Why question embarrassed everybody? And I said, Forgive me, no why, no how que why question. I have only how questions. <laughs> and they said, oh, you good boy, come over. <laughs> how to stay warm and survive during the cold weather? Wear four or five shirts, big boots, two pants, and walk like like this. Oh. How to communicate in English and be understood? Speak slowly. Don't hurry up. Make sure what you say 
is understood okay. Never stop reading books and watching TV because there you get new vocabularies. And I said, okay. But when I go to school at adult education, they taught us English, which is mostly grammar. But on the street, they're speaking a different English. <laughs> it drives me crazy. <laughs> and one day, in classroom, I said, teacher, how are you teaching us a English that is not spoken on the street? <laughs> and she said, that is, uh, what's it called? That is uh, slang. slang. <laughs> slang? What is slang? You don't need to know that. <laughs> because you need to speak a good English and write a good English. Stick on what you are, we are teaching you. OK, thank you. And it happened that people are using like verbs as a, as, a, as a phrase. And I went again, how are you teaching English? And they're outside, they are using phrasal verbs as phrases. Those are phrasal verbs. Time will teach you. OK. How to open a bank account here? You need to bring your, 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 your ID and your social security and a proof of address. Then you can open an account. Uh -huh. How to build and maintain a good credit? I told you, pay your bills on time. Then I was very curious, you know, I lost my home, eh? I told you. I had a big palace back then. And then I said, how to buy a house and become a homeowner? Long process. You need to bring 1,000 to the seller, if the seller agreed, it just keep it, and then you go, you find this, and you bring that, you go to apply for a credit. But after that, I'll be the homeowner? Yes. Just take a loan and pay it on time. Good. Now I came another question. How to be a good citizen? To be a good citizen? Never broke the law. How do people break the law if you do what is forbidden? So I have to start learning how to be a good citizen. But you know, from executive director to a worker in a, in a, in a in hospital or in a residential care, it's a big step, right? It's like a lizard was just walking on the wall and was on the top. And while on the top, instead of looking up, it was looking down. And mistakenly fall down from up. Boom, and start scrolling again. I said, uh oh. That's where I was. That's where I am. Oh, there's always wars. I can climb again and be up. And then I said, how to find a good paid job? They told me, take what you have now first, and then add your skills. And after, they will appreciate what you're doing, and they will rise little by little until you get a good job and also have people be your, um, give a good t testimony for you. Okay, good. How to garden here? Because I love to gardening. They taught me everything. And they even taught me how to cook a turkey. <laughs> Put it in the oven and whatever. So, all these things happen when you are in a, a process of learning and then happen what we call cultural differences. 
same thing, but differently accepted. In this country, if you are not looking at me, you are lying. You need to do an air contact. In my country, it's impolite to look in the eyes of the person when he's speaking. In some countries, to communicate, you just have to tune the tone. But in my country, it's like I'm fighting. Yo, I'm not fighting, I'm talking. Yo, Yakawa. I'm just talking. I'm not fighting. <laughs> and we will see that he say, look at these people. He's angry? I'm not. Posture. In this country, if you close your hand like my brother do, you are in defensive mode. <laughs> but if I want to be attentionate and follow what you're saying, this is how I do. You see the difference? Since we started, look at him. He has his arm crossed. <laughs> this is how he was educated. But here, everybody is like, hey. No. Food. In my country, you can't add sugar in food because the salt is already there. Now, you add salt and sugar. <laughs> oh, good. These are cultural differences. And someone told me, American is sweet. And I say, yes, but David is also sweet. You know? When we cook, we don't have oven, we don't have microwave. We have only fire, natural fire. So cooking needs some skills. If not, you get burned by yourself. In healthcare system, I don't go see the doctor unless I'm sick. And the doctor will treat me when I feel okay, I go back home. I will see the doctor again when I am sick. But here, every three months, you have to go to do a checkup. <laughs> every six months, check up. <laughs> they will go and check and find something that is killing you, and it was just sleeping in you. Don't wake it up. <laughs> Don't wake it up. It's sleeping in you. Let it sleep. <laughs> Doctors, please, don't wake it up. Because you'll bring me to now live with fear and stress and say, oh, I can't live any longer. Because they woke it up. <laughs> Let it sleep. That's how we understand that. Familial education. Here, I learned something. Never say no. My, my parents taught me three answers. Yes, no, and wait. But here, if you say no, why do you say no to me? That is abusing me. Why do you go against my way? I say no, because I know why. Wait. I don't wait. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> if it doesn't work, I have a number, 9, 1, and 1. <laughs> if I call 9, 1, and 1, someone would come and ask you why you are abusing me. <laughs> In my country, I will say, sit down. I will give you a lovely spunk <laughs> and say, I'm kicking out your rebellious mindset. <laughs> you need to be around the table. 
and people come and ask stories. Not be with a phone. <laughs> Dad is passing there, I don't care. <laughs> Mom is going there, I don't care. <laughs> you need to cut, switch off the electricity. Then you wake up and say, oh, what happened? Come over, it's time to eat. No, I'm not eating now. Mom spent her time cooking, making everything ready, and then ask you to come to eat. You say, no, because that's what they told him. You don't know a child in my country is like a plant. I have to wear, to, to watch my plant growing until I know it's strong enough to resist hurricane and all the different challenges. Then I can say, you're free to go. But here, watching too much is said to be abusive. So I don't want to lose you. I want you to grow. I want you to succeed. I want you to make good life. And I want to be proud of you anytime and wherever I will be. Discipline, I spoke already. Friendship. We are friends, and already everything is done. Then I switch to marriage. In my country, marriage means you have a time to prepare, to talk, and not come together. Culturally, when you are already together, you are already married. But here, I met a friend. I went to visit him. It was a cultural shock. The lady was doing everything good, and I asked him, can I talk to your wife? I don't have a wife here. I have a girlfriend. How long have you been with her? 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural shock. 25 years? Not your wife, a girlfriend? <coughs> Yes, this is how it works in this country, OK? <laughs> Don't go further. <laughs> and what is marriage? The small paper they give you at the city hall. It's completely different. And those people are coming from home to home. They have to learn and go through all this procedure to make sure they are not lost. I lived for some years in Portland, 2012, 17, until 18. And then I decided to move in the mid Grosco area, which is Bath, Maine, Brunswick, Topsam. Some people in Portland told me, why are you moving so far? And I say, I can drive 35 minutes and come to visit you. But I want, to, I want a place where I'm feeling safe. I feel loved. I feel surrounded by people who are ready to help me to succeed. And those people came the first day. I always remember some names, but I don't have all. Forgive me for those who are not written in this one. I remember Dr. Fred Hartman. He came and uh, helped us to relocate, as well as Jean Perkins. Jean took two of uh, my children. Dr. Fred uh, paid a, a camp. You call it camp van? Campground. Camp, OK, campground. It was their first experience living in a little tent in a camp. We didn't know that was a high price he paid because we are always uh, usually living in houses and uh, wars everywhere. It was funny, but not really for someone who just come from Africa. 
And those people were truly dedicated to help us to succeed. Jim as Fred and his wife, Jim Perkins, Betty, Alan, Dr. Dev, Michael, and others. All those people were spending time, means, and help my children and myself to learn some skills and to learn how to adjust. These people and all others who are here and who are volunteers, I salute you and I pay you respect because what you're doing is changing the life of many people. At that time, I was someone to ask for help, but now I can also help someone. Why? Because people like you did it. Teaching, driving skills. You know, in my country, <laughs> we, do, we don't have uh, red lights. Mm -mm. <laughs> I remember I saw them when I was, uh, I, don't, I don't even remember. I was, I think, 10 years old. But here, it's green, go. Yellow, stop. Red, don't move. <laughs> and those people, day after day, they came using their gas, their cars, to teach my children to drive. Now I have a college of drivers. <laughs> I'm no longer driving myself. Sometimes I say, you have to drive me now <laughs> because you are all drivers. This is the evidence and proof to have a neighbor who is in need to support. I can imagine how much you spend time to think about these people, to think about those who are coming, and you always try to find a way to have them succeed. This is what is lying in your heart, in your mind. That's why you spend time. And some even take their cars and drive people from Brunswick to Portland, Brunswick to Lewiston, Brunswick to Topsom. I want to go to Moroveco. I'm here, ready to go. What kind of humility you have shown us to be successful? Now, our life. We are living in a new home. We are now serving the community. I am the cultural service worker of the town of Brunswick. People come there and I help the best I can. My director is there. <laughs> Hello, director. <laughs> we help people. <coughs> if you didn't help me, I wouldn't be able to help them today. We are now taxpayers. We are participating in every budget of the, the town. We are in board of director of different organizations and launching some new projects and initiative to benefit the community. I know that some people may, may have difficult to clean their housing, but we have something done and ready to go. Because what? Because you helped me and you help those who are in need now. This was not possible without your open heart to welcome a new manner. Please, don't stop doing good. Jesus said, 
I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in your house. I was needed, I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison in Dallas when you crossed the border, and you came to visit me and give me a place to, to sleep. African coach Ubuntu says, because you are, I am. And that is make why you are, we are here, all of us. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your support that you are giving to new manners as you did to me. Tomorrow, they will never forget it when they become productive. After I lost my home, I'm proud to be among you in my new home again. Thank you. Thank you, so, oh, thank you so much, Maurice. So we have a few minutes to do questions and answers. So you all have paper on your chair, around your chair, under your chair. So if you want to just take a few seconds to write any questions you may have, and then just put your hand in the air, and one of us will come grab that from you, and we can start that. All right, and we're just in the interest of time going to get started. Um, so Maurice, this first question is, what was your most difficult adjustment to living in the U.S.? The most difficult ad adjustment to live in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Language. <laughs> Cold weather. <Yeah>. Two. <laughs> Um, so this one says, I'm curious about how old your children were when they came to the U.S. What was their process of finding a home in the new place different from yours? Or was it different? I think the youngest, the last born was 13. And the oldest was 25. 24, I think, 24. And I spent six years with, without them, so they were very little when I left. And when they came, they came big, big boys, big girls. And now they are in the colleges, most of them. Some are, will become CPAs, others will become graphic designers, and others will be engineers. So they are achieving what I couldn't make, and I'm proud of them. Awesome. Um, and then this one says, can you and have you applied for citizenship? How hard is it to be a US citizen? I plan to have it. It's a long process. You have first to apply for asylum, and after you have to get granted asylum. Once you get your asylum granted, you will have uh, to apply for a permanent residency, which takes like five years. And after five years, you apply for citizenship and you have to take a class and pass. But when you plan to be a citizen, you know what is waiting you. It's to be a supporter of the country, 
by paying your taxes, by working hard. This country is a country for hard workers, and we need to go in the same rhythm. So this next one says, can you share a phrase from your home so the group can make people from the Congo feel welcome? So can you share a phrase from your home, so in French or Lingala, um, so the group can make the people from the Congo feel welcome? Oh, okay. It's a feedback from the, from the speakers. Oh, I'm full of speakers. Okay. In my um, native language, welcome is Oyegerer, welcome. In Lingala, we say Boye Bolamu. Boye Bolamu. Bienvenue in French and Karibu in Swahili. Welcome in English. So when someone knock at your door, don't let him outside, it's cold. <laughs> Open the door first <laughs> and then ask him what. <laughs> <laughs> but somewhere, I don't remember who, where are you exactly? I went and someone was at the door, at the door like this. Hello? No. In my country, a welcome means come in. Karibu ndani. Ingia. Okay, good. Sorry, Lori. Uh, We're doing the best we can with sound. Yeah. So it's bad in there. What's wrong? <laughs> um, so this question says, how did you become approved or selected to move to the U.S.? Okay, it was a seminary of pastors. Let's say before, in 2005, as working in a human rights organization, we were launching a very wide network of uh, civil society activists who are mostly working to stop any uh, armed conflict. And the network is GPAC, Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict. So we as active of the civil society, we had to we had access to, to the, the people at the grassroots level. We have also access to the deciders, which are the authorities. And when a war or a rebellion sparks, the people can do a mediation or help those parts to come together and ease the conflict are us as civil societies. So we were trained as mediators. And by that, when we came for the first time, that was the reason. But the second time when I was getting out, it was a seminar of pastors. And I got invited here. And after the seminar, I told my colleague pastors that I can't go back because of this and this and this reason. And they understood because they knew already the story of what happened to me five years ago and how I was jailed for nothing and narrowly escaped to be killed. And even when I was out of the country, four more prominent human rights activists were killed. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't go back home. Then I stayed. That's how I was admitted here. Awesome. So this one is two parts. Um, what are three concrete items new Mainers could use? What? So <laughs> what are 
We'll do, what are three services or things we could help to do or teach as non-immigrants? Okay. I said in my speech that we need first to be tolerant with the cultural differences. I can't teach an adult person because he has already learned a lot in his journey of life. But I can share some thoughts in a sitting position we are discussing. But I can teach him some new skills. Let's say speaking English is a learning process. I came speaking French, Swahili, and Lingala. But the natives can speak Swahili and Lingala. I have to learn how to speak this language to be integrated in the community. That's one. Second, I want to learn how the law enforcement works. In my country, if you see a policeman, But here, <coughs> hello. <laughs> and one day I was lost in, in Portland. You know how the, the law works. And I was lost and I said, someone told me, if you are lost, stop the police. I said, what? <laughs> stop the police? And I said, I will try it. And the police car came with the blue, red, whatever. <laughs> I did this. <laughs> can I, how can I help you? Because the English was not there. I had to use my gestures. Help, go home, period. Now, he gave me a paper and a pen. I just wrote my address. And he said, oh, OK. Go this way, turn around there, and your house is just around the corner. <laughs> but it was in my country. Ha <laughs> ha. That's two. Third, regular checkup. <laughs> <laughs> waking, waking dormant diseases. <laughs> yeah, that's all three. <laughs> we need more. <laughs> Thank you, Maurice. Um, so we have a few questions related to um, like the process of being able to work. Can you explain what that's like? Like, how do you get your work permit? How long does it take? This is a process. And for whoever is helping an asylum seeker, this is a process. There are two types of uh, immigrants or asylum seekers. Those who came regularly with no more documents, visa and, and whatever, and those who cross the border. Let's say we are on the side of those who cross the border. Their case is sent straight to the judge. And they have to face the judge and give their reason of why they cross the border illegally. The judge has to discuss and give his decision. But those who came like I came, you need to go to apply for uh, asylum and not we be withheld. If you get an invitation of an immigration officer, you go to tell him why, why you came. If he grants you an asylum, OK. If he don't, he doesn't, then he send you to the judge. And after the judge, if the judge grants you asylum, that's the first step. Once you send your paper to ask for asylum, and if it's received, 
they count 150 days from when the paper was received to make sure you are eligible for work authorization. But in this case, actually, there is a clock at the judge governance. If you escape one meeting or you come without a lawyer, the judge stops the clock and say you will have to call again before I open it. Mm. Yes. So you need to follow what is required to qualify to get the work permit. Mm. So 150 days gone, you get your work authorization and a, a small paper like this, they call it social security <laughs> number. That small paper and the work authorization opens you the chance to become a money maker. <laughs> but before you get those papers, you have to rely to the general assistance and DHHS. And at the general assistance, we need to ask the person to go through all the requirements to qualify to get this, the, the, the assistance they need. If you don't qualify, we will repeat and repeat until we know that you have done all what we asked you to do. I couldn't know that if I was not working in a community now. Then, when you have your work permit, you may not go to apply for work. Can you go to work without speaking the language that is spoken in the, in the business, in the company? No. That's why we said the first things to do is to learn the language, to get the skills. And then it will awake all what you know before, and you can put your skills to the benefit of the, the business that you are working for. So language wait 150 days after applying for asylum, get your work permit, go start working, make money, pay your taxes, you're good. Simple. Simple. <laughs> and you built a good credit. <laughs> Thank you, Maurice. So this one talks about how the federal government has refused to speed up the waiting period before work permits could be issued. Otherwise, is the process of receiving the work permits working smoothly? It's for the federal government to know what they are doing. They have their plan and they are following it the way it should. But we can just advocate and say, instead of keeping these people become human feelings, let them go work, make money, and pay their taxes. We need to have them, the burden, take away. It's a big burden. I know you are, you are carrying a heavy burden. I look at some people I meet always. They are here and there with lawyers, with uh, social securities, with DHHS, uh, taking these people to different offices just because they are not qualified yet to work. So we, as we the, pe we the people, right? We the people, we can ask the federal government to speed up the process of issuing the work permit. So these people are not fed, but they are productive. Please. So, um, <clears throat> so the main delegation has, has really worked very hard to work with the federal government to expedite the, um, to do two things. One is to expedite the, the, work, permit the work permit authorization uh, wait time from 150 days to maybe a month. Uh, because it's a federal um, legislation, they've been unsuccessful. But what they've lobbied and have really worked is in the event that someone has a work permit 
and that work permit usually will expire in you know, a year or two years. Instead of people losing their jobs, now the United States Immigration, US, USCIS, is able to grant um, a waiver, there's language there, and that language enables employers to keep uh, the folks in their jobs so that there isn't a lapse between when the work permit expired to when they actually received, they're backlogged, right? And so they're going to keep working. That letter is in the personnel file of the employee, and when they get their work permit renewed, it starts from that date that expired. Thank you, and this is Fatuma Hussein. For those who haven't met her, she is an amazing partner and the executive director of the Immigrant Resource Center of Maine. Thank you, Fatuma. <laughs> um, so this question, how did your family of 10 stay safe as they waited to come to be with you? Okay. Those who grown up are married, three of them and only seven came with my wife. So we became again a family of nine instead of 12. Those who came, the youngest and the oldest, as I said, they had to, to learn how to adapt in school. The youngest was in the middle school and two daughters was, were in uh, high school. And the, the three others just took high state classes because they couldn't go back to school. And back home they were already in university. But because USA stand for you start again, <laughs> I told them, you start again. <laughs> From high set to college degree soon. Not amazing? So, yes, go ahead. So when you were a target, your they did not also target your family. When I am a target, my family is also a target. But when you left, did they leave your family? When I left, they have to move from place to place. At the time, within those seven years, I said I was a resilient. I spent maybe, if I'm right, in three months, two, to five days at home. Oh my the rest of the time hiding from place to place oh. mm -hmm. for all those years. And I have just to tell them, don't open, I'm not coming today. And I'll go like at her house and I said, I'm here up tomorrow morning. Give me a shelter. It was a normal life, but it can't be normal when you have to hide all your life. Yeah. Thank you for that clarifier. Um, what was your route in coming from the DRC to the USA? So how did you get, like, logistically from the Congo to the US? OK. Prior to come to US, as I said, I was a traveler. I was like uh, Gulliver, going from country to country because of the work I was doing. Most of the time I was either in Europe or in Africa or in uh, Caribbean, uh, not Caribbean, but Mauritius or over there. So I had a bunch of uh, Schengen visa. South African visa, American visa, like two, three. And when I presented my passport at the embassy, it was easy because they knew he is always traveling. 
He just came recently from Canada in a meeting with uh, uh, foreign affairs. He was in London talking with human rights and whatever. So why couldn't he get the visa? And it was very easy to get a visa. When I got a visa and came here, it was an opening door for me to hide and start again. Awesome. So final two questions. This one is, I teach new Mainers. How can I make new families more comfortable at school? Just give them the time to throw out what is bothering them. The problem, they are carrying big burden and a trauma for whatever they witnessed during their journey coming here, and they speak less. They look less and they can't because they don't know English. So when the sign language can work with your fingers and your eyes, use it until he gets the skills. I know our the teacher, the English teacher of my family used stickers. And this is an oven. This is a wall. This is a cupboard. This is what? So the new man who is learning English, he knows exactly what is by seeing the sticker on. Do that. It will speed up the learning process. Great. And last question. But, but, oh. Wait. Don't ask them to tell you their story. Please don't ask them the story <coughs> because they can get sick. Thank you for adding that, Maurice. Um, so final question is, what do you like most about living in Maine? <laughs> I wish I could be a fan of lobster, <laughs> shrimps, and all crabs, but it didn't work for me. <laughs> because those didn't work, I love winter because mosquitoes are away. <laughs> zoom, 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 zoom. No. But soon they will come. Are we ready? That's one. Second, your smile. Many are people who are smiling. I find people joyous and openly helping. So, why should I go away? I'm in Maine. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Maurice. And that is the end of questions. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you all for being here, and hopefully you feel energized by the last hour and some change. If you hope to walk out of here with some action items, we've got some. So number one, donate your resources, physical or financial. The town of Brunswick still has a GoFundMe that is open and supports asylum seekers moving to the community and there are more moving who will need household goods. The other one is to be a good neighbor, greet your new neighbors sweetly, and become educated. There's a list of resources on this table on your way out. Feel free to grab that. And our third is volunteer in the community, get involved. We have so many amazing organizations doing amazing work, and there's a website link on that handout that you can log on to as well. Thank you all.